Okay, so as introduced, Dominic Leve, I'm working for Lingaro company, and today I would like to tell you a couple of words, words on neural networks and with a special focus on activation functions. Okay, so a couple of words about self-promotion. Uh, I'm tra trying to juggle both professional career, working at Lingaro, at a company that does a lot of services uh, connected to the data science world from warehousing to, to reporting, user experience, and so on. I work uh, at a department that focuses on data science and machine learning. And from the academic perspective, I uh, mm, pursue my PhD degree, where I focus on uh, neural networks especi espe especially. Okay, why I selected such a topic? Neural networks are like a very big, uh, big topic and why activation functions? So there are many hyperparameters that we can tune when, when talking about neural networks. The architecture, the number of layers, the depth uh, of the neural net in other words, as well as the number of neurons, um, even the whole arch architecture because there are different types. Convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks like long-term, long short-term memory. So there are also the learning rates, the uh, techniques for in initializing weights. So there are simply so many that I had to start somewhere. And as I'm a curious mind, I, I simply focus at the activation functions at the beginning. So I'm actually happy, I don't know if you have seen the, the previous lecture, which told you a bit about uh, gradients and the back propagation. I also want to make a, a small introduction into this topic because it's going to be necessary when comparing different activation functions. So here I prepared like a very simple uh, neural net, uh, one that has uh, three layers, an input, uh, output, and one hidden layers, and uh, two neurons in each layer. And I would like to, to, to walk you step by step on, on the forward pass, on how the, the prediction of the, the network is calculated. So if we focus on a particular neuron, like for example the, the H1, the, the first neuron in the hidden layer, we can see that um, this is a, a combination of uh, linear input, so in this case the, the net value, so the input to this neuron, this is actually the equation that you can see here. It's a linear combination of the weights and the inputs, plus the, the bias term. Then this is uh, put through an activation function, and this is something that I'm going to focus on uh, today. And the, the, the value is uh, like forwarded uh, through the net so that we finally arrive at the prediction. And uh, the same analogy uh, goes for uh, the output uh, layer where uh, instead of taking the input, we take the output of the hidden uh, layer. Okay, so we know how to calculate the prediction, but in order to, to predict something, we first have to uh, know the correct weights. And in order to do that, we need to train this uh, neural network. And in order to do this, we need to have like an objective. And in, the, in this uh, case, it's the error function, which we, are, which we are trying to minimize when learning uh, what are the correct weights. So in this case uh, of this simple neural network, the, the error is simply a sum of, of the errors of each of the output neuron. Okay, so going uh, into the back propagation algorithm. Uh, the intuition behind this is that we want to uh, update the weight in such a way that we minimize the, the error of the function. And this is done through back propagation, so the calculation of a gradient. We want to know what's the impact, uh, like the, the, the influence of changing weight, uh, and in this case, this example, weight five, on the value of total error. And we can, we can do this using the, the, the chain rule. So if we try to uh, decompose the, the influence into like particular uh, steps, we can see that actually it's uh, the derivative of uh, the, the error with respect to the, the output of the neuron, and times the, the output, we, the derivative of the output with respect to the net value and uh, the derivative of the uh, net value with respect to the weight. 
So here we are talking about this, uh, this uh, part of the neural net. When we go deeper into the net, the equation becomes uh, longer. It's not more complicated, it's simply longer because we are still using the chain rule. So uh, it's like simple operations, uh, but uh, the, 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 the deeper the net, the, the more time the activation function appears somewhere in there. Okay, so going into the topic, the, 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 the actual topic, uh, I would like to compare a couple of activation functions in, in during this presentation, and the identity function, it's uh, like a comparison for me, the, the benchmark. So uh, it's not actually a, a function that I want to uh, show differences based on, on, on this one. So some properties of this uh, function, it has a constant value of gradient, uh, but uh, the, the main like, disadvantage here is that uh, we use the ability to, to stack layers because when using activation, this uh, identity function, the, we, we do not introduce non-linearity into the model. So basically, no matter how many layers we stack, there's still going to be a linear uh, transformation. But uh, the function that actually started the whole neural network revolution the sigmoid function. It's a function that has uh, like a nice interpretation in terms, of, in terms of probability, because it's from zero to one. It also has the analogy to, to, to brain, because it either activates or, or not, like uh, our neurons in the brain. But, but at, as it was the beginning of this whole history, it has a lot of disadvantages. Like for example, it has like pretty small uh, gradient value. And this I will elaborate more on on the next slide when I will, will be talking about the problem of vanishing gradient. But uh, another big disadvantage of this function is the um, problem of saturated neurons. So whenever we have an um, input value of uh, like less than minus 10 or greater than 10, you can see that um, the, the gradient will be almost zero so no learning will take place. So the, the neuron will become saturated and the, the weights will not be updated. So this might be a problem when we are trying to, to, to resolve a problem and the, our net is simply not learning. Okay, as I promised, the, the vanishing gradient problem. So as I told you, uh, the more layers we have, the, the more times the activation function appears. So looking at uh, at like uh, an example with free neural, free neural networks, each one having more uh, hidden layers, we can see that uh, the more times the activation function appears, the lower uh, the update of the weights will be. And this is because uh, even if the, in the best case scenario, we will have uh, the, the gradient equal to a quarter. So uh, if we lose the chain rule and we uh, like calculate the upstream gradient to those layers closer to the beginning of the net, the value will be very small. So the, the, that it will be harder to train the new neural network. Okay, the mm, first uh, paragraph I, I, I covered, the, the analogy to brain and the nice interpretation. But there is also one more uh, problem with this sigmoid function. It's not zero centered, so we have uh, the output that is always in the range between zero and one. And this can lead to a suboptimal learning path because uh, if our, um, if our uh, output function is uh, always, like output value is always in the range of between zero and one, it's always positive. And as we can see, it's a vital part of the, of the uh, way we calculate the influence of weight five on the error. Okay, so what's the basic uh, thing I wanted to, to highlight here? This is the part that is common for all the weights. So this is the upstream gradient. So all the weights that, we are, that are coming into this uh, neuron will share this part of the equation. So, uh, and uh, this is specific for a particular neuron. So, when all the neurons have output, a positive output, they, it, was, it will be always the sign, the positive sign. So the actual update of the weight in case of this function will depend only on the sign of the 
upstream gradient, which is the same for all the weights. So this will lead to a situation where we either increase all the weights or decrease all the weights. And if the optimal situation would be to increase some and decrease others, this leads to a situation where uh, the learning path is suboptimal. And I try to know, uh, depict it in a visual, like instead of going through a, the, the perfect uh, the, the learning rate, we, sorry, the perfect uh, direction, we are like increasing everything, decreasing all the weights, increasing, decreasing. So it's like more zigzagging. Okay, the hyperbolic tangent. Uh, it's another common uh, activation function that is used in the neural networks. Uh, yeah. So it is a function that resolves some of the problems of the sigmoid function. It's basically a scaled version of this function. And first of all, it has a uh, higher value of the gradient, so it's easier to train it because uh, it's harder to, to, um, for the problem of vanishing gradient to appear. Uh, and it's also zero-centered, so we do not uh, have this problem of suboptimal learning path. Uh, but the, the problem that still stays is the one uh, connected to the saturated neurons. So whenever we have an input value of less than ten, minus 10 or greater than 10, uh, the neurons become saturated and almost no learning takes place. And uh, like finally, we arrive at something that is used nowadays, something that, can, that is applied to like in state-of-the-art uh, approaches, the rectified linear unit, which is basically a, a combination of two lin linear functions. And you now, previously, using the, the, the other uh, functions, I elaborated a lot about you know, theoretical, uh, why is it like that? And we could derive this from equations. In case of this function, it's more like experimental results tell us that it's actually much better, it performs better. So for example, the, the convergence, so the, the um, time we need to achieve a uh, good result, a high accuracy, is lower for this function versus the, the functions that I described previously. Uh, it's also less computationally uh, expensive because previously we had to calculate some complex functions and now we simply threshold the matrix at zero. But it also has its drawbacks, minor ones, but still. Uh, in case of uh, rectified linear units, uh, we need to monitor for dead neurons and what I mean by, the, by dead neurons. So whenever we have uh, input, like observation or, or we initialize the weights incorrectly and we fall into the, the Mm. this area, uh, whenever the, the, the output value is zero, this neuron will simply not take, take place in, uh, will, not take, will simply not activate. So it will not take uh, any like, meaning uh, in, in the network. But like uh, in the academic community or even in the professional community, people argue whether it's actually a disadvantage or whether it's an advantage because this can introduce sparsity into the net. So it's like, um, mm, so we need to train less neurons simply and the, 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 new, the net becomes more robust in this way. Uh, the other nice, things, uh, nice thing about this is that this function has a lot of um, variations. Like for example, Likirello, which I'm depicting here, which is, which is a, Simple, like it simply adds some leakiness in the negative part of the function, which helps resolve the that uh, relu units problem. But there are also some more advanced uh, ways to, to, to parameterize this function. Even uh, the, the parametric relu, which uh, takes as, as a, another hyperparameter, if we did not have enough already, the one that uh, tries to optimize what should be the leakiness of the relu function. Okay, I told you like a lot of stuff theoretically, uh, but what should, what can you take from this lecture when you go and try to apply this knowledge to, to your neural nets? First of all, I would strongly encourage you to use rectified linear units as this is the activation function that um, has the best performance. But uh, on the other hand, you should uh, monitor for the fraction of, of that units because this is the main problem of this. 
if the number of that you need is too high, you could probably try to use Likirello because this is the one that resolves this problem. I would discourage you from using sigmoid function as this is the, the, the beginning of the history, a lot of disadvantages. Uh, and uh, hyperbolic tangent is an alternative. It sometimes can perform better, but most of the cases, the, the rectified linear unit is the one you should go for. Uh, again, comparing uh, all, the, all the things I said uh, about neural networks and the activation functions uh, in one place. So sigmoid, uh, saturated neurons, uh, not zero center, small gradient and vanishing gradient problem. The hyperbolic tangent resolves the, the issue of not zero center data uh, and it has a nice range of the output, but it still suffers from the saturated neurons problem. And the rectified linear unit computational efficiency, accelerated convergence, uh, but still dead neurons and not zero centered. Okay, here maybe more for posterity, posterity than for this, uh, this talk actually, a place where you have all the activation functions in one place and all the gradients in one place. Uh, you're probably thinking that I omitted one of the more important activation function, the softmax, fu softmax function. It's actually kind of a different uh, function because it's mainly used for uh, cat cat categorization problems. Uh, it has nice properties because it provides a probability of a particular category and uh, it sums up to, to one. But as I said, it's like more to the output layer than for the hidden layers. Okay, so now times for some experiments. I like told you that uh, Relo converges faster. Let's show it uh, in practice. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about the, the data. It's the MNIST data, probably all body knows, everybody knows uh, this. Uh, this is the handwritten digits and trying to recognize them. So I trained uh, same architecture of the net, uh, same learning uh, rate, all the parameters the same except for the activation function, which I changed in the hidden part of the neural network. Uh, and I'm comparing here the, the accuracy achieved by this, uh, these three approaches. Let's maybe focus, uh, zoom a bit uh, to, the, to the beginning where the actual differences happen. So as we can see, Maybe the difference when we look at the, the, the lines is not so big, but when we look in terms of like how fast do we achieve a certain accuracy, we can see that one of the lines like achieves this accuracy faster. Sorry for the small labels. The green one is the sigmoid function, the blue one the uh, hyperbolic tangent, and the red one the rectified linear unit. Okay, when we do the same, so when we zoom at the end of the learning rate, no statistically significant difference. And summing this experiment up, uh, when we look at the, the number of iterations we need to reach a certain accuracy, we can see that uh, hyperbolic tangent and rectified linear unit always like, achieve this accuracy a bit faster. And I, I'm always comparing to the sigmoid value. There's actually a sweet spot around uh, accuracy of 90% where rectified linear unit uh, does the job five times faster. When it comes to the overall accuracy, accuracy achieved, as I uh, showed you, there is no major difference. They uh, ultimately arrive at the same accuracy. When it comes to the computational time, uh, I was expecting to actually see that ReLU performs a bit faster but maybe because I was calculating this on my laptop, uh, it's why there is no major difference. Okay, uh, actually I did the same experiment, but using different type of data, uh, the, the text data, and uh, it was Reuters data and categor categorization problem, so assigning labels to, to text. And again, uh, all three functions compared. Here we can see that the hyperbolic tangent actually uh, outperformed by a little the, 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 the rectified linear unit, but they are pretty close uh, anyway. And the sigmoid still being the, the, the worst one. Uh, the same when we uh, try to look at the loss uh, of the end of the net. What I wanted to like uh, highlight here 
is that uh, I think that the rectified linear units try started to overfit a bit faster and did not ac achieve uh, the same uh, loss as the hyperbolic tangent. Okay, so all the experiments that I showed uh, here are available, like the code is available on GitHub. You are more than welcome to you know, come and uh, grab the code, reuse it, try to experiment on your own. I also encourage you to, to visit uh, a Facebook page, Data for Poland. It's a, a fun page for like-minded people that you know data science, like to talk about data science, like sharing uh, problems, solutions, and so on. And I also strongly invite you to, to visit our stand, the Lingara stand, which is uh, in, in that corner of the, the uh, Copernicus Science Center. So thank you very much. Uh, in case you have questions, I'm more than welcome to answer them here or at the booth, as you prefer. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, any questions for here? What is the difference between uh, leaky ReLU and parametric ReLU? Okay, so basically those are similar. You can think of this like in, in terms of uh, the leaky ReLU has a constant parameter, one that you select uh, a priori without any knowledge. So you simply, uh, based on your experience or like some industry standard, you apply this number. Whereas the leaky relu, it's something that you try to optimize as a hyperparameter. So, uh, so like for example, with learning rate, you can select different learning rate, rate and in this case, you can select an optimal uh, leakiness of the relu, and that's why it's parametric. Any other questions? Are there any disadvantages to using leaky relu? Because you mentioned disadvantages for all the other ones, but none for that one. Like uh, for now, I think that it's the safest approach. Um, as I said, in terms of uh, relu, it's more experimental than uh, knowledge coming from theory. So, uh, yeah, basically, I think this is the, the, the best you can go for right now. Uh, I think that the question was about uh, problems with using Rello, correct? Uh, like, not problems in terms of uh, industry or particular data type, more like uh, problems where you can see that the number of dead neurons becomes like too high. In compared to the total number of neurons in your uh, in your net, so this is like one uh, thing that I would monitor, and if this number becomes too high, I would uh, 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 then try using something different than Relu. Uh, are there any other, I don't know, new exotic activation functions that are out there that might be promising in the future? Uh, actually, like so many of them, so it's hard to you know list all of them. I think I have seen a nice uh, blog post that was uh, released last week by Deep Learning Weekly, which had like a, f a long list of activation functions, like comparing all of those. Maybe you can. Uh, try to look there.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic.